Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I'm Scott Kalbach. I'm a professor in the Department of Political Science in the Harris School of Public Policy here at Chicago. Uh, thanks for joining us for our update from Kiev, Moscow, and Chicago. So let me introduce our panelists. We're gonna have short statements from each of our panelists and then we're gonna open it up for questions. And so please do send your questions along. We're eager to hear from you. We're eager to have a chance to respond to you. So we have with us this morning, Timofey Milovanov. Timofey is Associate Professor of Economics at the University of Pittsburgh, but more to the point is president of the uh, uh, Kiev School of Economics uh, he's joining us from Ukraine. Uh, 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 he's a former minister of economy under President Zelensky. We also have Konstantin Sonin this morning with us, or this afternoon, I'm sorry. Konstantin Sonin is the John Dewey Distinguished Service Professor at the University of Chicago, uh, Harris School of Public Policy. He's visiting the Higher School of Economics in Moscow on sabbatical for the year. And we have with us Monica Nalepa, who like me is a faculty member in the Department of Political Science here at Chicago. And Professor Nalepa is a specialist in the politics of uh, countries uh, uh, in the post-communist region. So thanks to you all for joining us this morning. I'm gonna turn it over to Timofey Milofana first. Timofey, why don't you tell us uh, what you're seeing? You know, when there is a war, you really don't see much. And it's kind of um, interesting to realize how little we, we know and how much we construct. So we have a feeling when there is no war, we have a feeling that we understand what's going on. You know, we can say, oh, in Kyiv, this is happening. And in Odessa, this is happening. And in Lviv, this is happening just to take Ukraine. And then in Berlin or somewhere else, something else is happening. This is because we were in Odessa a month ago and we were in Lviv half a year ago and we have not read in the news that something major has happened there. So in your mind, there is really this feeling of completeness. And I didn't realize it until the war. I don't know what is happening hundred meters from me, let alone what's happening in a different town. Furthermore, it's changing. So, you know, I can only rely on what I see. I, I am in some place and uh, there have been sirens and uh, sometimes we miss them. So I don't know what's happening, you know, two blocks from me. So, so but what we read and, uh, you know, how do you actually, I think for an academic, I'm sorry, I, we're not delusional. We're just, you know, it's new normal for us. So we're still humans. We're still logical. You know, we get scared. We get, we come back, you know, we, we cope in different ways, but we, we, uh, we operate, you know. The probability of, uh, you know, of dying is high, but, uh, you know, it's extreme, but we still are human, you know. So, you know, I think um, it's, um, it's kind of, um, it took me, you know, a long time to realize that objectively, I know maybe what's just around me. It's a very different feeling. And it creates all kinds of fears, you know, you fear for the loved ones, you start, you know, like parents, you know, when they don't see a child. Now I have that feeling for everyone who I care about, my sisters, my wife, my friends, uh, you know, I check on them, you know, it's, uh, so what helps work, you know, you, you have to work. If you work, uh, then it becomes normal. Uh, and we have been fortunate enough because we're resilient. And I, I think these people also didn't understand that Ukraine has gone through these two revolutions and these two revolutions, it feels like another big revolution. This is how it feels. I'm just doing exactly the same thing I was doing on Maidan, raising money, figuring out who to trust, who not to trust, where to ship what, who is having problems, coordinating, supporting. So it just, the scale is very different, you know, in um, here's a story for you, like a two sentence story. My sis, uh, okay, some relative, okay. In 2014, he, he just got a, gun, uh, a Kalashnikov to protect the east of Ukraine. This, this time, within 24 hours, he was sitting in a tank, and it's not a regular tank. They went to some uh, military academy, took a tank, fixed it up, found munition and are running it, okay? They are defending Kyiv with three other, with faculty, faculty from a military academy, okay? So faculty from a military academy, teachers, took three tanks, called up friends who have military experience, 
and now they're protecting a certain block in Kiev. So I, so I think it's, it's a big Maidan, but un, unfortunately, you know, it's not of our choosing again. And it's really nasty and um, it's devastating. And, you know, once you go on TikTok, I recommend you all go on TikTok. That's where you really will see the scale. Uh, and I've seen a lot of camaraderie. So, for example, I, I have a friend who is on the Forbes list. He flew back in from Austria and to Kharkiv, and he's defending Kharkiv. I know the previous head of the administration of the president, who was really in a position to the president. They fought really, really hard. Um, he came back, I think, uh, also from some European country, and he's now in Kiev. Uh, and, you know, there is in macroeconomics, if you say there are a lot of transmittances, remittances, um, people say there are a lot of Ukrainians are working temporary or full time in, uh, in Europe. Males are doing that quite a bit, sometimes females. They're all coming back. Not all, but a lot of them. There is a flow of people coming back in the opposite direction. And I was at the headquarters, military headquarters yesterday or the day before yesterday, because wherever you are, you have to, you know, it's full mobilization. So you have to go to a drafting station and you have to register. And even though I'm protected because I'm still advising the government, I have to register. So I'm there, I'm advising the government, I'm registered, I'm on reserve. There is a bus leaving every five minutes to the front line, full of people. It feels like, you know, there will be no males left in this village. So it's not a conflict. It's not an isolated war. It's a major, major war in which millions of people will be fighting. That's how it feels on the ground, okay? And yet gas stations have gas, shops have food, and obviously Zoom and Wi-Fi is working. Timofey, I think a lot of people here want to know how they can help. So I know that you've been doing a lot of work with support from friends around the world. Can you tell us a little bit about, from your perspective, what people can do to help? All right. So there are three things I want to say. And uh, one is, please demand no fly zone. And I will accept, uh, explain what I mean by that. There's a lot of discussion. So basically, Ukraine will win or will hold its ground, it's obvious, if there is no fly zone. The Ukrainian military is a big surprise to everyone who has not studied Ukraine. But to everyone who has studied Ukraine, it should not be. Because in 2014, we kind of uh, lost Crimea without a single shot. And then in two years, we managed to engage Russian military, and there were a couple of big battles, uh, Ilovaisk and Donetsk, Minsk 1 and Minsk 2, where Russia essentially sent one or two battalion groups, tactical battalion groups, uh, tank with tanks, and they crashed our military. And, um, you know, we had to negotiate and sign certain things. This time, Russia has sent over 100 tactical groups, tactical tank battalion groups. It's 50 times more troops were sent against Ukrainian military than in 2015. And they have not taken a single town in a week. And Kherson fell recently, okay? So that suggests you the, the rate at which military improved. But we won't be able, you know, we, a lot of people will die. And I'm pretty convinced that in the end, no-fly zone will be implemented. The same with sanctions. It's, it's like the same with stingers, you know? And this story that it is gonna escalate and it's gonna freak out Putin, it's all bullshit because I remember the very same language. There's basically no evidence. No one knows where the red line is and what's gonna, and I think a lot of them have been crossed and uh, they are now attacking nuclear stations, mining them, you know, uh, putting mines around them. It's, it's insane, you know? So um, I remember in 2015, 16, there was a big battle and uh, the government of the, uh, you know, the US wouldn't give us uh, javelins. The same argument was done. It would provoke Putin. Okay, javelins were not given. Did it stop Putin? Um, and uh, I think the same is going to be here. Unfortunately, the stands only force at this stage. Or at least it's how it, uh, it looks. Because every assumption you would think that a rational person 
would uh, would kind of make you know would do he 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 violates it you know would you fight around nuclear stations you wouldn't but okay he does would you sell would you sell Kharkiv that's his voter base potentially would you sell Odessa that's his voter base you know which cities he is shelling he's bombarding he's bombarding cities where he had the most support for pro Russian parties. It makes no sense if he wants to keep it later. So basically, he wants to destroy it. Because if he want, if anyone ever will be voting there, you know, he got the entire population against himself. So no fly zone is needed. It will be, you know, but as our president said, I think yesterday, how many more people have to die so that we will, institute, you know, and then the president said, I'm going to start counting, you know, tell me, you know, I'll be counting how many kids have to die, how many legs people have to lose, how many heads have to fly, how many residential areas have to be destroyed. So no fly zone. The second one, I think everyone should not be in denial. That's not going to stop at Ukraine. Whoever thinks that somehow it's going to stop at the border with Ukraine or Ukraine will be split and somehow stops their the escalation has no empirical evidence or argument to back it off. It's only conceptual. But conceptual arguments don't apply because they have been proven wrong time and again. So what we see is a very clear empirical pattern of escalation. 2008 Georgia, 2014 Crimea, and the east of Ukraine, 2014, 2015, 2022 Ukraine. And every time the scale is much larger. But we also see Belarus. Belarus de facto is not sovereign anymore. Why? Because they, you know, they are launching rockets and planes you know, from their territory. And I don't remember uh, any parliament voting in on this. Uh, then you have Kazakhstan where the troops were recently and you know minor example but it's the, it's a pattern. Then you have Armenia, Azerbaijan, you have Nagorno Karabakh, you have Pridnistria, Moldova. You have harassment of the Baltics. You have threats to Sweden and um, and, and Finland about uh, about uh, getting, you know, about NATO attempts to you have uh, some flirtation with nuclear threats you know all kinds of rhetoric so you know I, I think it's a pattern it's not just ukraine so my second point is like that that you know whoever thinks it's going to stop it's you know it's not going to stop there unless ukrainians hold the ground and it's probably the third point is this that ukrainians have agency and uh, there has been what i call russian splaining like mansplaining you know we always have been looking internationally, what through the lens of Russia and Putin, what would Putin want, you know? But it turns out that there is first resistance in Ukraine and had Ukraine folded, then there would be next episode. What would Putin want? What would... And everything went off because there was 2014 and there was 2004 and there was 2022 in Ukraine. So maybe the question is what Ukraine wants too has to be present there. What can you do? Call your representatives, politicians, and make these arguments if you believe them or make your own arguments, but we need no fly zone. Second, you know, as we talked, um, give agency to Ukraine in your conversations. You know, don't objectify Ukraine. Don't look at us as if we're some exhibits in a zoo who are fiercely fighting, but are gonna die anyway, you know? We might be fiercer and we might be more resilient than some of our neighbors. And so give us agency, donate, donate not to some Western institutions, donate to those who are on the ground. You know, I have my donation page for the Kiev School of Economics. We have been able to raise $4 million. Goods are being shipped to Kiev. Imagine that. So because we're on the ground, we know how to sneak them in. And it's coming, you know, there are no middlemen, lowest prices. So we're doing this as an institution. We turned the entire Kiev School of Economics as an institution for the wartime. We're providing analytics. For the, for the government, we are providing humanitarian relief, we are fundraising, so donate. And the last one is, uh, you know, it's a little bit more specific, establish, you know, programming like this one with us, with Ukrainians on different topics, establish partnerships, dual programs, dual degrees, uh, anything, you know, anything which will bring Ukraine intellectually into the world and will give it age. But I'm talking as an academic, of course, you know, as a, uh, you know, you could do it in any realm or area of life. So political pressure, financial support, give agency in terms of your attitudes, take Ukraine seriously, 
and do projects with Ukrainians. I think these are the four things. Thank you. Constant, thank you, Timofey. Konstantin Sonin, you're in Moscow. Tell us what it looks like from your perspective. Uh, okay, first, um, yeah. uh, hello. We already participated in one uh, round table with uh, Timo, Professor Milovanov, who was under, in Kyiv, which was under Russian bombardment at the moment. I just want to repeat um, how sorry I am for this happened, and I think this is, Timo, a crime, terrible crime, and I hope that uh, people who are responsible for this, they will be uh, punished. It, and I think what I just said, that's what basically uh, basically my friends and my peer group say in Moscow, and that's what we feel, feel shame and guilt, and especially, and it's sort of Sort of strange because that's what feel uh, this feeling have those people who protested for many years against war, who wrote columns, who went who went to meetings, who went to uh, jail and arrest for protesting against war. Just today, Yuli Galemina, who was a participant of our round table in May, uh, went to jail once again. Macha Lekinov put a red is uh, serving 15 days term, but it's for the third time in three months. So she basically spent half of her time on the house arrest and half of her time in, in, in jail. And just to get this seriously, the Pussy Riot there, they were the first protesters in Russia 10 years ago against, against war when many much more sophisticated people I would not have realized that this is basically the, the main danger. So this is what my peer group uh, thinks. And so uh, hundreds of people left Moscow, hundreds of people that I know left Moscow over the last week. And I have dozens of friends now in Yerevan and Belisi and Istanbul. Some of them have kind of safe landing. Some of them are just in Yerevan and nowhere to go. So that's it. We also have a group of people in Kremlin and around Kremlin and people who speak like them, who live a kind of in a parallel universe. In this parallel universe, there is no uh, no wars, just border skirmishes. There, today was the, yesterday was the first day when the Minister of Defense acknowledged a single casualty. So you could watch, uh, you could watch TikTok or you could watch Twitter, you could watch whatever, and you could see um, you could see prisoners of war, you could see uh, burned tanks, you could see bodies of dead soldiers, but the uh, Russian media prohibited to talk about this. So basically, all independent media by today um, stopped, uh, stopped operating. And just we, we, our round table was uh, already, um, already, uh, already started when uh, the government shut down Facebook. It was not operating for the last three days, so it's just official information. What was going on? So when you uh, write to Russian friends, do not use uh, the messenger or Twitter. Okay, and the other people think um, think very dif differently. So people in the Kremlin uh, they think that there is no war. There are some border skirmishes. All of these things, and this is what uh, the Russian propaganda translates. But I think you sh nobody should make any mistake. It's not clear what people what people think, because propaganda is perhaps serving mostly the uh, tiny ruling group. So, like the ruling group, the political elite, they basically watch their own propaganda channels and they believe in this. What other Russians think or do, nobody knows. There is, uh, there is no reliable sociology and there has been no reliable sociology for at least 10 years in Russia. And I would, uh, like, there is no independent, any kind of sociological research. There are no researchers who are not censored. I mean, during what they read. So we do not actually know what uh, Russian people think. Certainly, we do not see 
uh, kind of euphoria that was there when the Crimea, when Crimea was annexed. Uh, certainly, there is no much popular discontent uh, in um, in what is going on. So hundreds of people, thousands of people actually were arrested over the last uh, four days uh, around the country meeting in protests, but it's not clear how much this is. The thing is that the Russian population doesn't actually know about the extent of the war. Even the extent of the sanctions is unknown, again, because a lot of things, uh, a lot of things cannot be read, uh, written or said uh, on Russian media. So uh, it's sort of paradoxically, but I think the most um, effective channel uh, that let all Russians know about the sanctions uh, was the sporting sanctions, which were, were mostly non-political and decentralized. But this is the, for the first time in 70 years that a national team is prohibited to participate in a, in a World Cup. And everybody knows that North Korea and Iran played in the World Cup, uh, have played in the World Cup recently. So I think this is not what hurts, but it at least makes all people know that something goes, uh, goes terribly wrong. I think these dynamics will change once the causal causalities are going to be acknowledged. Now, basically, every region is allowed to say, like the governor of every region is allowed to say that the region lost one or two people, and then there are some ceremonies about this. But otherwise, I mean, like, the smarter is the person in Russia, but I think smarter, the grimmer assessment. So like, for example, I do not see any kind of, um, any kind of good um, military end of this. I mean, there are, uh, there is a huge variety of bad, uh, of bad endings. There could be a total military, I don't know what, defeat uh, of Ukraine, and then there will be an endless civil war in Ukraine, because Ukraine is um, many times larger than uh, countries that experienced this kind of attacks before, like in Syria and Afghanistan or in um, in Chechnya, the world was has never been that united in support of one country. So, um, relative to uh, Chechen warriors or Afghanistan uh, mujahideen, the uh, Ukrainian army and possible insurgents gets. Uh, much more help, so there is no good military ending of this. I mean, even like I, I hate to analyze this because every scenario looks bad. And then I do not. I'm an economist. I do not think that there is any good economic uh, economic scenario for Russia. So whatever happens on the battlefield, where the outcome change from very bad to extremely bad. Um, I do not think that sanctions will be lifted until all the forces are withdrawn from Ukraine. So that's a long time. And um, economic sanctions has never been um, introduced against such a rich and de de developed country. So I expect, I don't know, minus 10%, minus 15% growth this year, and then stagnation for the uh, foreseeable future. Thank you, Konstantin. Monica Nalepa, there are many, many people who have had to leave Ukraine uh, in the past week. Some estimates suggest a million refugees from Ukraine in a single week. Tell us how countries bordering Ukraine, countries in the region are, are managing this flow of refugees. Yeah, um, thanks. So, um, so, so, so first of all, I'll just for context say that the last time that there were uh, this many 
uh, refugees uh, coming from uh, Europe, from one part of Europe to another uh, was in, in the aftermath of World War II. And uh, it, it actually also happened on a very large scale in Poland. Um, at that time, it was uh, as a result of the Yalta Treaty, which shifted the, the borders of the country to the West. Um, and it had such uh, reverberating uh, consequences that we saw the effects of uh, those migrations even three decades later in political attitudes and economic attitudes and social attitudes and so on. Um, so so a, a bulk of those refugees are, are flowing into Poland where uh, which is a, sort of a natural destination because for the for the last decade um, Poland has been absorbing uh, guest workers uh, from Ukraine and not just guest workers but many of them have um, have uh, acquired residence there have built families uh, so it's a sort of a natural destination when you're fleeing well you'll go to, to, to places where you where you know people and uh, what I will say is you know the the the, the small glimmer of hope in, in this tragedy and you know global catastrophe is that for countries that had been um, bordering on uh, this danger of backsliding into autocracy such as Poland, Hungary um, and, and others in, in the post-communist region, uh, this, this invasion of Ukraine has actually brought them closer to the EU. Um, so since 2015, um, in Poland, the, the populist government has been largely growing in popularity on promises of sovereignty from the EU that was so seen as a sort of like bad bureaucratic regulator. And I think what this invasion showed is that, thank God, Poland is actually a member of these international organizations. This also goes back to something Timothy was saying earlier about, you know, granting agency to, to Ukraine and, and appreciating that it's a, it's a country that makes its own decisions. I think that as scholars, we've allowed ourselves to get sucked into uh, this discourse of superpower politics in, in, in sort of like anticipating what should happen or what should you know, the US do. And um, th this, just following through on this logic, if it hadn't been for the joining of NATO of former communist countries in the late 90s and, and the European Union in early 2000s, it wouldn't just be Belarus that is the country where Putin can launch its missiles. It would have been all the countries surrounding Ukraine because what else was there to make democratization attractive if not joining those international organizations? But I feel like you know the same agency has been deprived of you know those uh, post-communist countries for decades. And you know I just want to make a postulate to just like silence those you know that, that superpower discourse, which is not falsifiable and just not scientific at all and it's clearly not leading to anything good um so yeah so the the effect of um uh, the refugee flows uh is that um for the first time in uh fight in seven years there has been um bipartisan legislation passed in the polish parliament extending health and educational benefits to refugees uh the whole civil society has mobilized in uh providing help both on the border and and throughout you know even you know people who had been very busy making money with the most libertarian ideas that i have seen are you know putting together donations and sending tears to the to the border so so i think it's you know paradoxically actually uh, preventing um further authoritarian backsliding in post-communist countries and bringing those countries closer to Europe and bring Europe closer together. Uh, now, this is in the short term, of course, like what this, and this is, it all sounds callous, but it's, would, would, it's just a million refugees. I mean, how many more are to come? And, you know, how well will Europe do with absorbing the rest? So I'm, I'm very hopeful that it will do well. And I hope that, you know, those, uh, Eastern European countries, formerly post-communist countries, can you know be the basis where um, where you know Ukrainian civil society can reconstitute itself as a diaspora and uh, you know and, and mobilize from there. It's it's extremely sad, but I think when you know when countries uh, turn um, when and uh, you know and not just for Ukrainian refugees, but for Russian refugees also, I hope that we will be as welcoming for, for, for Russian refugees. And I think one of the, the downsides of, you know, countries turning totalitarian is that, you know, the only place where opposition can function is abroad. So. Um... Thank you so much, Monica. Um, I think that's a really important perspective. Um, okay, so we have time to take some questions from our audience. 
Um, so please feel free to add a question to the chat, or I think we don't have any questions in the queue. If you'd uh, uh, like to just raise your hand to get us started, then you know that would be another way to ask a question. Um, Mikhail Khartakovsky. I don't have a question. I just want to support Timofey as much as I can. And uh, he should know that we, many of us trying to do what we can here. So just rest assured we support you. It's very proud of you too. So that's all Thank I you. have to say. Thank you very much. We do, we do, we do know that and it actually matters because at times things are difficult and uh, it's good to know that there are people in the world who, who like you, like Constantine, like Scott, like Monica, um, who understand what's going on really and don't fall for this false, false reality that's been constructed elsewhere. And more people realize that, uh, as you said before, that it's much more than just about Ukraine. What you're fighting is a battle for all of us because uh, I for once was saying it for a long time, what we see in Russia is the resurrection of fascism that is adapted to 21st century. And you're fighting against that um, and you're in the front line. And that's, I fully agree with what you said before. Uh, if Ukraine falls, there will be more because like Stalinist Soviet Union, where Putin's Russia an expansionist power that uh, cannot exist, Putinism as a system cannot exist in peaceful conditions. Maybe Constantine will disagree with me, but I think it's very much what uh, Kennan was talking about when he was developing his doctrine of containment. Again, political scientists can correct me or add to it, but uh, um, Ukraine is simply at the front of it. And so I don't know how to how grateful and how uh, thankful we are to all of you fighting this battle. I wish I could do more than I am doing now. But thanks again, Timothy. Okay, great. We have a question in the chat from Matthew Wefflin. Um, let me um, let me uh, 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 let me paraphrase the question. So, so the war has gone. Um, the war has been more difficult for Russia than perhaps Putin might have anticipated. So why not just claim victory at this point, consolidate whatever gains he's made and cut the war short? The answer? Please. I, I, I think that one mistake that was consistently made during this crisis by analysts and by a lot of analysts, just uh, look at what they wrote up until February 2024, is that they over strategize and over analyze this. Again, what you say is theoretically makes a lot of sense, but you need to, like, given the evidence, you need to, to you need to understand that the Russian leadership uh, has a very different worldview, like really worldview, and they're not inconsistent about it. If you read what President Putin was writing over the years, what he was seven, se uh, saying over the years, then it's clear that he sees the world in a very different. That's a very different view, and. In his view on the territory of Ukraine now, there is a genocidal regime led by neo-Nazis and Russia saves itself by, um, I don't know, cleaning up these neo-Nazis. This is a worldview like completely uh, devoted, uh, devoted from the idea that I understand it the way I understand it, but what President Putin does is totally rational in the reality, in this reality. 
and trying to strategize in the our reality what he does. It's it's made to so many folks, so many people. Like just just pick any strategist and watch what she or he wrote on February up until February twenty four about like this bluff bullshit and things like this. Of course, this I mean what you say theoretically is possible, but um, but I don't believe this that this might. Happen. Monica Nelepa. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to take this, you know, in a in a in a different direction. I definitely, you know, want to go back to Putin. But one of the things, you know, that I've been hearing about is that, you know, one of the parts that sanctions haven't one of the directions that sanctions haven't gone in yet is, you know, the refusal to buy uh, oil and gas from uh, Russia by by the U.S. especially. So, uh, so U.S. is apparently like still buying oil from the uh, from from Russia. Uh, and in part, it's because, you know, of existing sanctions against Venezuela and Iran uh, um, and not trading as much with Saudi Arabia. So it's it's basically, you know, it's it's it's, it's not a, a dilemma where you can, you know, choose right. You can just choose the the, the, the better wrong. But but but, you know, I, I was wondering, you know, this may be a question to to me. Hey, do, do you do you think that 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 would um, help sort of this, this to, to help prevent Putin from financing the war if the sanctions went that deep. I can understand why, um, why you know what, what, why they're still being withheld. I mean, obviously, this would these would be probably sanctions that would hurt Americans themselves, which maybe they should. Uh, but what is what are your views about that? And, and and Constantine as well, if you could talk about that. We have we have two economists on our panel, so uh, if the war continues for some time. Obviously, Russia will need resources beyond those with it with which it started the war. So, where do those resources come from if Russia is under sanction? Yeah, who goes first? I, I, I hey, Scott, why don't you why don't you go first? All right. So you know there is this acute stage of the war right now which is uh, in fact very very interesting who has more resilience it's unclear how much you know the, what's puzzling about this is that uh, putin has committed 95 percent of troops already in ukraine and is not moving more from the rest of russia that's really boring i think um okay so and the, it's just simply not enough even for kiev the amount, this amount of troops. So in that sense, right now, sanctions, what they are helping, they're helping, you know, it's not an asset kind of story. It's not a stock, it's a flow story. Um, whoever gets uh, diesel fuel to a tank faster <coughs> wins. It doesn't matter how much you have in stock, you know, it really doesn't. It means what matters is how many kilometers you have to drive it uh, to the tank <coughs> and how much, how secure it is. You know, convoy would be, and Ukrainian supply routes are much more secure. Again, this is a question about agency. Okay. It looks like okay, Russia is attacking everywhere, but you know, Ukraine is attacking convoys too in the north of Ukraine, everywhere actually. So that's why convoys are not moving very fast, because what you, the Ukrainian military is doing is letting the first groups run through run out of diesel and uh, they ambush convoys. And then when the front groups or assault groups are immobilized, they, they ambush them too. That's why it was spectacular, a spectacular failure because there's strategy behind that. And with Air Force, with everything, there's actually strategy. All right, so, so that's one thing. Sanctions are helping here in the very real sense. Because when a CEO of a company or a state official is thinking about getting his children or his assets to safety, he's not shipping oil or diesel to Ukraine. That actually has an effect. When people there are panicking or are busy or are worried about other things, the supply lines become even more disruptive. I don't think sanctions will stop the war or cripple the economy or you know fundamental okay people will you know will experience worse standard of living but you know russia could have been 
a prosperous democratic state. And that's a big tragedy too, you know. In these 30 years, Russia could have been a very different country. Somehow it doesn't stop people from, you know, it, you know, it's supporting Putin. The fact that they can look at uh, London or Europe and see, you know, in Ukraine, people really get upset that our standard of living is not the same as in Poland or elsewhere. That's a constraint, but I don't think that's a constraint in Russia for popularity. In Ukraine, it's a constraint for popularity of a president. So I don't think sanctions are going to have a political effect. But it depends on what kind of sanctions. If sanctions really get nasty, if they go like, uh, we have not seen yet uh, military sanctions. What I mean, taking sanctions as a military. Um, I shouldn't be saying more than I know, but there are sanctions which will make people really upset with the government of Russia. Just uh, they have not been used, I think. Constantine. I'm sorry. Yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah, I think I okay. think that's okay. Yeah. Before before answering directly the question, I will take issue with the support because of economic discontent. Because I do not think that there is an easy way to translate people unhappiness into regime change. That just look what happens in Belarus. I think every reliable sociology or research that we know shows that Lukashenko has a very small small support. It might be like, if there are three elections, he might get 10% or 15%, or maybe less. And people are not unaware. People do know that he is unpopular and they are unhappy. But thousands of people are in jail, and Belarus is a tiny country. Tens of thousands fled, and everyone is basically scared. The, the number of arrested people was 50,000, and Belarus is essentially like New York. In, uh, in size. So the thing is that the people that are unhappy and the leader, and there is a regime change, there is a wide gulf between uh, these two things. Okay, so that's one thing. And the second thing is that any economic sanctions, they cannot have an immediate effect. Russia could get poor uh, three times uh, or two times, like it basically could live through the experience of 90s once again, and still could wage the kind of war it wages in Ukraine. It's just like a different time scale. All the huge amount of Russian military resources is already there. These tanks are constructed. These soldiers are conscripted or, conscripted or contracted. So um, the thing is that even the most scripting of economic sanctions cannot cannot help military in the short term, but of course they have an effect. Professor Kartakowski. Um, yes, just uh, to have a different, uh, slightly different opinion here. I want to disagree a bit with my good friend Constantine uh, when he said that uh, he really believes that Putin believes that these uh, Nazis, neo-Nazis in Ukraine and whatever. I have a different impression. I don't think you can trust a single word that comes out, out of Putin's mouth. He said many different things at different times. These were before they were Nazis, then they're now drug addicts. The, tomorrow there'll be something else. He said many different things about, about different issues. Uh, and of course, we know that if you tell the same lie for a long time, you may start believing it. So some of it he may be believing now. But I really, I think that's the major problem of the West has been taking what Putin says seriously. You cannot do it. He's a professional and brazen liar. So I'll let Kostya answer. Thanks. Why don't we actually move on? So we have a number of questions in the chat. Thanks so much for that perspective. So Nathalie uh, de Font Nouvelle uh, uh, asks about Putin's support among the oligarchs, the oligarchs whose yachts are starting to be seized and palaces are starting to be confiscated. Uh, uh, a small, uh, exceedingly small economic elite that, that is suffering directly from the sanctions. Does this have consequence for Putin politically? Constantine. 
Constantine, would you like to address that? I, I was still thinking about how much I disagree with Professor <laughs> Professor Khodorkovsky, because <laughs> I I think that there, there is so much um, psychological analysis of what President Putin might mean, but actually there is very little attention paid, is paid to what he actually says. So when he says and writes and repeats it over the years, but there is no such country as Ukraine, then somehow it gets ignored and not taken, it's not taken literally, and it's also not taken seriously. That's what he says. Timothy, let me ask you if I could. So, yes. so um, uh, one of your uh, close colleagues in Kiev, Daria Kalinyuk, the head of the Anti-Corruption uh, Action Center in Kiev, has, has been um, uh, publicly campaigning for some time for the West to sanction Russian oligarchs. What's the model of Russian politics that underlies that suggestion? Yeah, the model, I think, is if you put pressure there, I think that's their thinking of Darius and others that, you know, if you put pressure like that, then they will put some pressure on Putin. And I don't think it's just working. Okay, that doesn't mean that uh, there is no secondary logic, which is less, much less theoretically appealing, but in practical terms, you know, it's a contact sport. Wars are not won on concepts, they are won on as I said, on who gets to the tank first, you know. So sometimes uh, a little bit of a bite helps. So if you put sanctions on oligarchs, you actually create structural problems in financing. You're destroying some of the existing networks, or at least you're disrupting them temporarily. So that slows down, you know, that the, the idea here is that, so the idea here is that you want to stress the bandwidth of decision making mm -hmm. during the war. I think that's what uh, the informational and uh, cyber attacks served to achieve, first of all. The idea was that Zelensky, for example, would lose command or would panic. In, instead, he consolidated. That, you know, for the first two days, not everyone was so patriotic and clear about, you know, people were preparing for guerrilla warfare. But then after the first or second day, they realized that there is a good chance that the uh, Ukrainian military will, will resist. And now it's just, you know, it's normal. Everyone is fighting, okay, in regular, regular form. So I think you want to stress, stress the bandwidth of the leadership and sanctions can do that temporarily. Monica Nalepa, are Putin's oligarchs tied to him forever? Do they have a way out of this short of some sort of pressure on Putin to, to change course or some change in, the le in leadership in Russia? Yeah, so I, I've been thinking about this, you know, from a transitional justice perspective, which is, you know, the main domain of my, my research. And I understand sanctioning uh, oligarchs as a way to prevent them from funding Putin's endeavors. But, you know, one thing that I, I, I don't understand here is you know, by sanctioning them further and further, aren't we just like tying their fate uh, irrevocably to, to Putin himself? I mean, so when you're when you're when when you're trying to get somebody to, you know, like leave a bad organization, like you you, you almost like have to offer them something in return. So, in other words, if you know if if all of their resources are cut off and they are being um, probably rightly so uh, vilified. You know, like what are their exit options? I mean, like what what do they get for 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 leaving Putin? Because I think there seems to be a consensus that you know he, he cannot be pressured into into changing course, and he certainly hasn't you know been using um, the oligarchs as an advisory council, but rather like a private treasury. So I'm I'm just I'm just curious. You know, for, for this is a question to those who've like fully thought this through. Like, how is this exactly supposed to work? Okay, good. Um, Russell Zanka, I think you're muted. Right, so I'd asked this question in the chat, but uh, maybe people thought it was rhetorical. 
Um, no, we've just I, we've just we've had a lot of questions. We're trying to get to them all. Please, sure. please go ahead. Well, yeah. my thinking was that uh, you know, is it getting to a point where there's frustration among Ukrainian people and Ukrainian leadership that the world's strongest military alliance and the world's greatest military power keep standing by and not really doing anything? And obviously, there's kind of a big concern about World War III, uh, which we can all understand. But, but I'm just wondering, is, is it going to be soon? And I, I would address this to Tim Fay first and foremost. Uh, you know, are, are, people being, are, are people frustrated with this, with this idea or with this lack of inactivity? Tim Fay, do people in Ukraine feel supported by the West or abandoned by the West? No, I think we've just Maybe. lost him. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I will answer in a 30 seconds. My apologies. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No Good. Let me just tell people while we're waiting, we're going to we're going to wrap up at one o'clock. So if there are any last questions, please um, get them in the chat. We might have time to get to one more. We might not. We'll we'll we'll, we'll have to see. I'm back. I can talk. Apologies. It's just really fluid here. We are handling. We're just juggling millions of things. The so the question is, do we feel abandoned, the right? West are abandoned by the West? Okay, so no, we feel frustrated. It's like, you know, guys, we we're telling you, give us weapons. Give us weapons so we, we just, it wouldn't, you know, earlier. Give us financial support, you know. Give us, uh, help us invest, you know, build this, you know, don't, don't, like, you know, you can't have ideal perfect institution don't you know get hang up on imperfections in the monetary policy or infrastructure or procurement processes or law enforcement the judicial system yes it is all important but we are cleaning it up and it's not as fast as some people want and you know but i've been in the meetings with ifis western ifis where they would dictate uh, and i don't i know it's recorded but you know we never took it we always said fuck off you know but they, they would try to dictate who should be appointed where and you know until i became a minister I, I thought that kind of thing doesn't happen but it does you know there would be a vice president of a famous of a big uh, top four ifi in the world and he would say that guys we're really hoping, uh, we're really hoping, uh, you know, this person will stay in, in this position, you know. I'm like, what is going on? And the president would say, Zelensky, by the way, would say, no one is going to dictate to the president of Ukraine the governmental appointments. And uh, Americans didn't like them, didn't like him for that. And we would get our trenches from the IMF or something else delayed. You know, and this was ridiculous. But Tim of today, 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 when on the one hand, there's been an unprecedented response of the West imposing sanctions on a major economy that have never- yeah, Okay, so I'll answer. I just, I was trying to be diplomatic to evade yeah. the question. Of course we feel abandoned. What the fuck, you know? 10,000 civilians are dead, you know? And people are discussing no-fly zone. You know, the nuclear power plant is being attacked. You know, what, what else do you need? You know, come on, you know, seriously. I, I think, you know, you have many other countries would resist like that. You know what insults me the most? That the West didn't, you know, the politicians didn't believe we would resist. And so they, we had to pass this test, you know, the first several days, pay it in lives. So that was, they will start giving us some support. That really gets me. So yes, I don't feel abandoned. I feel angry. Okay. Listen, I think we should end on this note. Um, thank you everybody for joining us today. Thank you, Timofey. Stay safe, do your work. Yeah, we'll work. And with you. We will work. Thank you, Constantine, for joining us. Thank you, Monica, for joining us. Thank you to everybody in the audience. We'll see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay.